It's okay to not understand a sentence, a a word, a page. You just start to grow this tolerance for ambiguity, and then suddenly you start to understand more and more of it. And then suddenly you've got you know 200 books read, and it's like, oh, I actually did understand the plot for some complicated things. So that's that's kind of cool. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back. Hope you had a Merry Christmas immersing. So this episode, we actually have a guest who just finished immersing before getting on the podcast. Uh, it's also someone who eats kanji for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's right. We got Kanji Eater here, the co-host of the amazing Deep Weeb podcast. And aside from having a great podcast, he's been on a, his own Japanese journey for over six years and has also spent a period of time working in Japan as a software engineer. So today we dive deep into that journey as well as hearing some of his helpful insights on learning in general. Also, guys, we're trying to hit a thousand subscribers on YouTube. So if you're listening on there, it would really help us out a lot if you hit the subscribe button if you haven't yet already. So I hope you guys enjoy the podcast. See you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Korakata Podcast. My name is Raza and I'm joined by my co-host Eric. We talk to people of all types of backgrounds about their lives in Japan, studying Japanese, or even tips and tricks on how to learn the language. This week we're joined by a very special guest and friend of the show, Kanji Eater. Yes, so Kanji Eater is one of the hosts of the critically acclaimed Deep Weed Podcast. And he has been studying Japanese for a little over six years. And as the name of the podcast suggests, he's been deep into immersion learning and has actually worked abroad in Japan as a software engineer for six months. I first came across Kanji Eater's podcast when he actually joined our Discord server one fateful day, and they go live on Twitch every other week with great guests. Not only do they talk about their experiences with immersion learning, but also progress with deep goals, personal development, book recommendations, interactive chat, and more. But today we want to explore Kanji Eater's personal story with Japanese and working abroad as a whole. So, Kanji Eater, can you give us a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? Yeah, yeah, that was that was an awesome introduction, guys. Thanks so much. I'm I'm super thrilled to be on the show. Like like we've talked about, this is uh this is this is a faded day where I get to join the Cory Cotter podcast because we've already uh, crossed our paths before with uh, Deep Weeb cross Cory So uh, it's it's cool to be back on uh, back talking with uh, some old friends about Japanese stuff. As far as what I am, what I've been doing. Uh, super passionate about learning Japanese well not so much the learning more the using the Japanese part and uh super into software development that's how I've made my living and been able to support my crippling addiction to reading manga and uh also uh enjoy heavy metal so go to concerts a lot went to concerts in Japan that's kind of my thing that's uh that's really kind of where I found myself right now and I've been wanting to share it and kind of document what I've been learning along this process and that's kind of where the Deep Weeb podcast spawned out of was having some conversations with some cool people such as yourselves and Jordan who's my co-host uh, somebody that I met on Twitter kind of hit it off with pretty well and we've been we've been talking about what we've been learning and just streaming that to Twitch and it's been a really cool experience so far I can't forget Shinzo Abe <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he hasn't he hasn't responded to my invitations. I was like, surely he's on Cory Cotta podcast. Like, I'm tight with those guys. Maybe maybe I can get in. But after what you guys did to him, apparently not. Uh, well, well, we'll try to get a good word in for you next time. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Native step down. Yeah, there, there's always next prime minister. There's always the next one. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess kind of getting started with your journey to, uh, with Japan, um, I guess, Kanji Eater. So how did you first get introduced to the country or maybe some of like anime, for example, or games? Yeah, so I, I guess it's <laughs> kind of, if, if you look at it super broadly, that I don't know that there's any other country that I think of, you know, when did I come into encountering that country like but but at least with japan i kind of do have that memory i think i think for me it was with uh, godzilla that that was that was the first encounter is like this is super weird uh i'm a kid there are giant monsters it's cool 
I remember going to Blockbuster with my parents and, uh, you know, getting an overpriced uh, VHS rental. And they always had a large selection of Gojira. And, you know, seeing that and growing up with that, getting some toys, that was probably my first real exposure to it. And then, you know, you have you have those kind of small experiences as a kid that kind of a little bit nostalgic for. So that existed, that was there, that was probably the seed of, oh, hey, Japan's kind of cool. And then from there, it's like, oh, well, all, all the games and stuff that you're into are uh, also from Japan. So, you know, growing up, saw, saw a lot of Pokemon, saw a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh, that sort of stuff, got into games, and that was that was really probably where things started getting kicked off for me was uh, getting into things like the Tales of series. That was that was really where it was like, okay, well, this is this is a very cool series. They're doing something very unique. It's fighting game mechanic crossed with an RPG. Like, hey, this is this is something that I'm super into, and I want to do more games like this. Right. At right. what point did you consider yourself a deep weeb? A deep weeb. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, fantastic question, Eric. Uh, <laughs> I, I ask myself that almost daily, honestly, because it's just like. At what point did it, did I go into this hole where I've spent six years of my life trying to get into some some culture when I, I could just be satisfied, you know, watching CSI in English and not, uh, you know, doing anything related to Japan? There's plenty of content in English. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it, it was a gradual process. You know, you go deeper and deeper. You keep trying to find more and more weird stuff. And Japan apparently Before has... You know it, there, there's no bottom to this weirdness. It's I'm still going, man. <laughs> there's always yeah. deeper. There's always yeah. deeper. I, I hope we don't see you at the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you mentioned the Tales of series, though. So, what was it? Was it like specifically? Because I, I know you mentioned in your first podcast that it was one of the primary reasons you actually started getting into Japanese because you couldn't get and play like the the other games that were already out in Japan. But I guess we'll, can talk us about talk to us about that moment where you realize like, oh my god, like I, I really got to play these games and I need a different language to like actually understand what's going on. Especially for these JRPGs where there's a lot of story involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, you're, I was a kid in high school. I just wanted to play more video games. And I was, this, this, is, this is where I was at. I was, I, was, I was coming home every day from school and I was checking for this one specific website translation blog called Absolute Zero. And this guy had put out translation patches for Tales of Games. And like Tales of Fantasia and a couple other ones, uh, eventually. And I, I was coming home every day checking, hey, like, you know, what's the update on this? Where is this thing at? And I had this this hope, you know, that, oh, there's going to be some update. There's some new nugget of information where this guy is making progress, actually bringing over some of these games that are super fun to me. And so uh, eventually, you know, <laughs> doing that, Every day through a couple of years of high school is like, dang, I'm I'm probably like I, I, I think it was probably my junior year where it really sank into my head that, yeah, this is this is something probably worth pursuing at some point in my life. I'm not sure. Like, and that's just it. I think no, I, I know that I actually tried a little bit in high school to learn some Japanese, uh, but it was like I, I can't balance this in school i didn't have any time management skills to those people who are doing you know immersion based language learning in high school like props to you i couldn't figure it out at that time but for me it was yeah i was like oh this this these games they have stopped coming over so at some point like i'm just gonna have to dive into this and figure this out for myself because i can't really rely on this one dude who's blogging and doing like a, a essentially good Samaritan work to publish these games for free because that's that's what I was relying on. And it turns out that was probably a good decision because like I was waiting for his translation of Tales of Destiny for forever. And that, that game, it never actually got translated by him and he stopped doing translations. So I was like, okay, well, I appreciate the work that he did. I also understand that what he was doing was 
not human like one dude translating multiple games tales of the tempest uh tales of innocence and tales of fantasia like he and a programmer had been doing that and eventually they they you know life life came up and they decided to stop dedicating hundreds of their hours for a free thing like that so it was like oh well it turns out during this time that I've been learning Japanese, it's it certainly hasn't been a waste because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to play that game in uh, in English now, even if I wanted to. Yeah, salute to that guy. I mean, I remember back in the day in high school too. I was like, oh, when are these translations coming out, guys? You gotta you gotta work on it. But like, really, it's like you're saying, it's unrealistic, and life comes up. But I mean, they got a lot, gave us a lot of good memories with those translations. <laughs> yeah, I was, could, I was yeah. super big into anybody who was doing a translation patch. Like I, I had my list of bookmarks that I would go and check and see how they were doing and try to try to download it. I, I don't know why it was that. I don't know something about it being a little bit different, a little bit something that I wasn't supposed to be able to experience in my own language that kind of drove me to, you know, just want it even more probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, makes sense. So, I mean, this was kind of like the start of kind of wanting to learn Japanese at some point in your life. So, I guess, when exactly did the time come for you to be like, okay, it's time to get myself to start learning Japanese? Yeah, so, so, so that came through a series of failures, I would say, on my part on on, tr- on trying to figure out when that right time was because like I said I I started glancing at the Genki 1 textbook in high school tried st- tried learning hiragana and katakana and was like okay this is this this has already taken me a great amount of work and I have other things that I want to be doing with my time so I don't really see how I'm supposed to be getting good at this right now I'll have to take a class for this at some point in my life because that's how you learn skills so so that was the next thing. And then at some point, even like Rosetta Stone was in, in the picture for me. And I like found a, let's let's say, trial version of it and was playing around with that. And it was, at, at least that was clear to me that that was an awful path right away. I wish some <laughs> of these other paths that I went down where I had to try it for a while and then fail uh, would have had as fast of feedback as Rosetta Stone did, which was like, oh, this is, you know, it claims to be immersion-based learning, but um, you don't really learn that much that fast in that one. So anyways, so I had some experience with that. That was in college at that point. And again, in college, it was it was all computer science all the time. So I, w- I didn't have a lot of time, I didn't feel like, for any sort of extracurricular fun things like that until my last semester there. And so at that point, somehow I managed to get into the Japanese 101 class at the university that I went to, even though I wasn't supposed to because I was a senior and they don't want seniors coming in there and not taking the full range of courses. So I may have told them that I, I, I look like a senior, I, I get it, but I'm actually going to be here for another couple of years doing some other things. And then those other things didn't work out, so I really only took that one semester of classes but um that that was that was where it started at least for me that i managed to get into a course that i wasn't supposed to be able to be in and i really liked it and they the teacher there was actually as far as language learning courses go uh she was fantastic she was super super hands-on super uh involved in uh, making sure that you had things like quizzes every day very active it wasn't just teaching from a textbook or something like that so I think seeing a little bit of her passion on it uh, helped help, uh, inspire me. And I, I will also say that that classroom used a custom textbook that they had made at the university I went to, which was University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. So they actually made Nakama. Uh, and that is a very overpriced textbook that I cannot recommend because it is way worse than Genki. <laughs> I actually used university. that textbook before. What do you think about it, Eric? Uh, I really disliked it. Okay, that's that's how I feel <laughs> yeah. about it too. <laughs> yeah, it was, I like, bet they're unnecessarily watching. complicated. Yeah, <laughs> I actually have like the still. Yeah, yeah, it was like two hundred bucks. 
I have actually the teacher's edition or something because she, she ended up giving it to like, hey, if anybody wants this. But the teacher's edition has all of the like uh, answers and things in full Japanese. So as a mm. first semester, first year semester student, I was just like, ah, this is I thought this may be an advantage and it is not. But I still have it on a, t on a shelf somewhere. Yeah, uh, I really wonder what episode of One Piece they were watching when they came up with the title for that textbook. <laughs> 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 but I, I guess going with the, you talked a little bit about how this kind of classroom experience was a little bit different. Like on the podcast, we hear like all sorts of stuff about classroom learning, especially coming from a lot of people who are deep in immersion based learning. They tend to say, I guess, a little negative things about it. But I mean, it's always good to hear when there's like good teachers and kind of a different, I guess, um, look at towards, I guess, what's going on in the class. But would you say after this, for this semester of Japanese 101 at college, how would you say your Japanese improved from, I guess, like nothing to something? Yeah, that that's just it. You know, I kind of, it's it's been a long journey of doing this for like six years as a kind of like side hustle you know it's like mm -hmm. it's it's not my full-time thing it's just when I, the energy i have after you know working a long hard day in the coal mine right so right. come you know doing that sort of thing <laughs> what's what's it like uh for, for this extended period of time i feel like i have enough breadth on this topic to to appreciate it but also know that it wasn't the most efficient path for the goal that i had right mm -hmm. and i i don't think i mean at that point in my life i didn't have the capacity to even realize that mentally that 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 wasn't the best thing for me but it was the thing that started me on the right path and co again coming from a place where it seems like if you want to learn something then take a class for it don't don't just do it was the mentality and now my mentality is definitely more of if you want to learn how to do something the best way to do that is by doing it i should have i should have recognized that immediately being that i came from programming and like software engineering like that's exactly how i learned how to do software engineering it wasn't through the classes it was through personal projects so i should have realized that it, it was it was very similar in in learning japanese that i need to actually be using the thing that i want to to be doing not just reading a textbook about the thing but uh, you know i i will say uh, again uh, six years doing this i've had many different things that i have tried many different things that have failed uh, and yeah it, it was it was one piece of that puzzle yeah sounds like the origin story to a software engineer by day and kanji eater by night <laughs> yes yes exactly right <laughs> Is uh, before the dawning of the mantle, but I. <laughs> but um, yeah, and and again, in one of your videos, you talked about how there is a period of time where you were really also into music and specifically guitar, where it's kind of interfering with your, I guess, drive to learn a lot of Japanese. So was it during this time as well, or was it maybe a little bit after college where you're kind of debating between the two and how'd you kind of come out with Japan, or I should say kanji eater on top? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it, it was it was, it was was cutting into the deep weeb time, man. I was like, I, I don't have, again, at this point, this was, I had just completed college. I just got a full-time job. I'm about to get married. And it's like, okay, so guitar has been my thing since I was a junior in high school, essentially. So that was, that was, that was what my identity was wrapped up in. Like on weekends, I go to concerts, right? I go and see whatever band is screaming into a microphone. Like that's the criteria. And, you know, taking that, that semester class, I, I knew all through high school and all through playing guitar that at a certain point I was going to learn Japanese. And I also knew that I wouldn't probably be able to balance both of them efficiently because I couldn't do it in high school. Uh, at, at least that was, that was my thinking at that time is that if I'm going to, if I'm going to be doing one thing, I want to be doing it really well. I want to have, you know, depth in a subject 
so that I can do the things that I want with it. So in, in guitar, it was, you know, play in a band, record some music, that sort, sort of thing. None of that happened during my during my college because I was I was too busy with figuring out how I was going to be supporting my life uh, efficiently with software engineering. So having that recognition that I was like, OK, well, I've gotten to a point where it's fine. Like I, I'm comfortable with my abilities on guitar. I can record songs. I can do what I wanted with it. It seems like this is probably a natural transition for me to say this is the end of college. So this is a new phase. This is I'm kind of ready to try something else. And, you know, for a while I did try to balance them out. And uh, again, just with my time management skills at that point in my life, I it, it just didn't work out. So I've been, you know, th- that being said, I have a guitar like right next to me right now. I still play on it, you know, about once a month. And it, it's one of those things I got to a good enough point where I can still play some of the songs that I you know, wanted to. I can still write music that I wanted to. Eventually, I probably will make music for certain projects that I have in mind in the future. But for right now, it's like I, I don't have to be spending my time on this thing, getting better at it. I want to be spending my time getting to my Jap- my Japanese to the place where I want it to be. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we missed out on Cord Eater. Uh, apparently, that Cord was Eater. Yeah. Oh man, I'm, I might use that. <laughs> <Or> yeah. <Peter. laughs> there we go. That's that sounds edgier, so I like that. Yeah. There we go. But now we're kind of going on to the rise of Kanji Eater out here. Um, the Mighty Rise. Yes. The Mighty Rise. Yeah. I guess you might have to just make like another uh, YouTuber Twitch channel, like a live stream guitar once a month. Just <laughs> there we go. <laughs> when, when you it, pick it up, it's it's time. I will, to record I will say it. now, it would be very embarrassing if I did that. I do not practice enough. But yes, one of these days. <laughs> Hey, maybe you can use it to practice Anki. I don't know if you've seen those videos where people go and like to like get their guitar and connect it to their computer and do random stuff. <laughs> I, I have thought about doing that. Yeah, using using Anki to learn you know, certain music things. I think that would be fun. Um, also, kind of awful, but that's that's, that's besides it's, the point. That's <laughs> a potential idea out here, guys. Don't steal yeah. it. Uh, anyways. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So now kind of going back to the kind of rise of kanji eater out here. So <laughs> <laughs> you've mentioned that after after you graduated, you kind of had this moment where, again, like after you decided Japanese was the way to go in terms of the side hustle. I mean, you put you said side hustle yourself. I don't know who you're hustling. Anyways, that's besides <laughs> the point. <laughs> you you managed to go on to the learn Japanese subreddit and assemble a dream team. Uh, yes. A, a little bit better than the 92 dream team, actually. It really represented the world on this one. But how was, how was that? And I guess more so, what was your favorite memory kind of assembling a, a kind of like a group of people kind of going toward this goal of learning Japanese and kind of learning more yourself after kind of taking a class? Yeah, so so that's just it. It was, as you said, the dream team um, of the blind leading the blind. And uh, <laughs> I have to say, the the best part about it was the not studying Japanese part, quite honestly. It was genuinely, I think that probably says a lot about the group itself, but we were actually very serious about, you know, trying, trying to get good at Japanese um, despite <laughs> despite the outcomes of it. Um, the the most fun part, the best memories were just getting to hang out with, with those people. Like I'm still friends with some of them. I think I mentioned in my podcast already that, uh, one of them actually works at the company I work at now. We imported him all the way from Australia. Um, so it's pretty cool to see like how a random friendship on the internet and a random thing, like learning Japanese is kind of. I mean, it's worked out pretty well for him. He's going to get married over here, so he gets to marry a American woman. I guess that's that's a good thing for him because now he gets a green card over here and that sort of thing. So he he says it's working out fine for him. So I believe him. Uh, so so it's it's cool to see like little random things like that. It was also it was really fun having people from all over the world uh, kind of joined in this one small group. So I had like one guy from Britain, one guy from Canada one guy from Germany and then an Australian guy and me. 
And it was very rare that we all got to be in the same study session at once just because of the timing. Everybody's in a different time zone. I think like the German guy would have to wake up at like 4 a.m. But occasionally he would do it. And so just like getting to hang out with people like that um, and talk about how we were doing, it was it was a really good way to pace things as a self learner because it gave me some rivalry, right? It was like, Mm -hmm. okay. I'm I'm pretty well matched with this Australian guy. I think I can beat him. I can't beat the Briton guy who like already knew like an Ethiopian language or something like that. So it was like, so I, I'll I'll try to at least take out this Australian guy. <laughs> and so like ha- having that, you know, that that rivalry, you know, it's it's critical to every anime plot, but it's also critical to your own self learning. So I, I I found that to be yeah, a, a fun way. If again, it's like uh, we were still going through like textbooks together and doing doing group exercises, and it probably would have been better just to, you know, put on some anime and immerse in a um, in a dark room all by my lonesome self. But uh, I, I I went a different route at that point in my life. You brought out the fun zone on him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't wait until the Kanji Eater um, Netflix adaptation comes out, but um, he'll let us know on the Deep Weeb podcast when that does happen. But <laughs> yeah, who's who's going to play me again? I forgot. I thought they were talking about that. Who did... I, I think it was Keanu Reeves, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, he's the best actor. Who else would play me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look forward to it, guys. Keanu Reeves is going to be there. I mean, that's all that needs to be said. <laughs> So I guess you you kind of mentioned to the fact that you were kind of like a self learner at that point and like you were talking about like the blind leading the blind and this is kind of a whole idea where a lot of people find themselves when they're like one day I want to learn Japanese and there's like such a wide variety of resources out there and so many options you can take that may not may or may not be the most efficient right so i guess false kind of, profits yes false, false profits, profits. <laughs> there, there are many that try to mislead you there is only one true way to learn japanese i'm trying to find that i still haven't found it but i'm getting closer getting closer to the truth <laughs> yes one kanji at a time one kanji at a time i mean i hope they taste good man hence the that's <laughs> <laughs> how you cook them yep how you cook them up how you saute them how you see anyways um so uh so i guess with all these resources out there kind of you talked about the study group what else were you kind of in the beginning looking at before i guess you came across immersion learning yeah so uh, everything uh so i was looking into let's see i was taking night classes and Despite that, I was probably a semester ahead or so in the textbook with my own study group. So that was moving, like my study group was moving at a faster pace. So then I was using night classes as a review. And so mm-hmm. it was like in those night classes, it was, I was already ahead. Most of the people, there were weird things like that my Japanese teacher didn't know. I, I've mentioned this before, like just like stroke order and things like that, which again not not super like critical as a beginner learner to know your stroke order today there are ocr programs that can just figure out what it is that you're writing and i think that's probably typically the the th- thing that people were still clinging to with stroke order that you know it'll it'll look uh, more authentic or things like calligraphy it's still important but anyways things like that i was still like i was plugging into trying to learn everything the right way and i was i was just running into the like little hurdles like that that oh well my teacher didn't really care about that thing and my teacher is now like kind of teaching through a textbook and that's that's fine but it's you know I I took all the classes because still at that point it was like hey at least I'm going to be making progress and I I will have ways of testing myself and knowing that that I can see the progress right because that's that's one thing that in like immersion based learning you don't always have a good reference point for where you were yesterday versus today, whereas traditional learning, like you're able to see, oh, well, I, I passed this test. So that that can give you an illusion of progress, even if uh, that's that's probably not going to be the best uh, measure of, of your ability in a language is some sort of written exam that tests what you learned the last week. So how far did you get with uh, classes? Did you finish uh, Nakama 2? Okay, so so I took I, I took 
yeah, Nakama One was at 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 my four year university. When I started taking night classes, they switched over to Genki, right? Because it was a different school. Because it was it was I was doing night classes, and so I went all the way through Genki Two in that. So that was over the course of two years ish. So so yeah, that was that was where I was at with that. I I'll also say just to answer the question a little bit more fully of you know what was I actually doing during that time. I think around, so it was after I came back from my honeymoon, which was in that, that same first year, I started doing like italki lessons. So I'd gotten through Genki 1. I had also gotten through RTK. So remembering the kanji, I blasted through that uh, despite having really bad retention on the kanji and uh, was was just trying trying to figure out what the next step was. So the next step felt like, okay, well, I should start working with a tutor and I kept that up for probably like two years after this maybe three years and um, I also was doing things like you know when I was listening to things when I wasn't listening to metal I was also listening to like (laughs) Japanese pod 101 like some of the lessons but honestly I always kind of hated it Um, I thought that the lessons were a little bit okay so so some of the lessons in that are, are just plain awful some of them are at least listenable and practical and have more emphasis on on things. Well, they're, they're done by people that know what they're doing, and sometimes they're done by people that don't. And that was that was really evident, even as a beginner. Uh, but anyways, I really didn't like Japanese Pod 101, but I, I would still do it because it's like, hey, this is how I'm going to get good at the language. There's also, I think it's called Michelle Thomas, and that's like a... Uh, it kind of simu- simulates you being in a classroom, basically, where you are. Uh, they say something in Japanese, and then you would say what your response would be to the tape, essentially. So anytime I was driving somewhere, because in America, whenever you go to work, you're driving someplace. So I was I was doing that, and I was you know practicing uh, that piece, and I, I would. I, so I got through the entire Michelle Thomas series. I got through, let's see, like one of the first shadowing books. I was doing that as a beginner as well. Uh, so yeah, it just just about anything I could I could do besides immersion based learning because I didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess then kind of you've gone around everything and you've kind of gotten a taste of what oh, maybe some of this works, maybe it doesn't. How did you kind of first come across this whole idea of immersion? Yeah, so it was, I was still doing, I was going through textbooks on my own at this point. The study group had kind of gone their own ways. People people weren't pursuing Japanese as much in that group. Uh, so I was doing the, what is it, Shinkansen series, which is a Jap, it, so it's, it's a textbook in Japanese where you're targeting uh, JLPT things. And I think the JLPT, like I had, I had been quite content to ignore it until I started working with my tutor. And then she brought up that, hey, like it's better than nothing as some sort of gauge for, for where you're at. And so I was like, okay, well, my goal isn't to pass a test. It's to actually use it on fun things. But here it, it, it seems, it seems natural to, again, keep pursuing things that have benchmarks along the way. So I started doing that. And I started, for some reason, I got stuck in my head that I should be doing uh, a lot of things with grammar and that if I could just piece in the grammar, that the vocab would come along the way at some point. For whatever reason, like, I don't think of myself as a particularly stupid person, but my actions sometimes say otherwise. And so being in college is like, it it, it seems like... (laughs) I don't know what caused me to study grammar for so long or what made me think that I would I would somehow get good by just studying grammar. And to top all of that off, despite me grinding at it, despite me making like Anki cards for every grammar point and that sort of thing, it wasn't sticking. And I would come to these questions, even in the textbook, that I would be like, I still have no idea what this is at the N2 level. So it was like N3 was was nothing like i could get through that using traditional methods as soon as the n2 pieces started coming into it it seems like the breadth of vocabulary maybe on top of 
the nuances of grammar that I just wasn't getting it by going through the same examples in a textbook over and over again. So that's where I say like, it's like, hmm, something should have woken me up sooner probably that this method wasn't working, but it took me failing the JLPT into twice to, to actually be like, okay, well, it wasn't just a fluke the first time. I really am not making progress. In fact, I have stagnated because my scores both times were very similar despite me continuing to put more and more effort into Japanese around the four year mark. So, you know, you, you hear about people that, you know, were able to pass the N1 or something like that without uh, doing anything sort of immersion based learning. And then they eventually say, oh, I woke up and I found immersion based learning. I couldn't even get through the N1. In fact, I still I can't get through it. So and that's with immersion based learning. So so, you know, I might be really dumb. I don't think so. But these things clearly take time like this. So, so like, yeah, that's, I guess, just encouragement to anybody else who is taking a very long time with this thing. Uh, it's It's been quite a long journey for me. Uh, it's just, despite me getting a computer science degree from a top five university for computer science in, you know, four years, I still haven't been able to get to a high degree of Japanese like like I've been targeting for a longer amount of time. Now, granted, school was a full time thing, whereas this is a, you know, passion project on the side. So that might be part of it. But um, as far as hours put in, it, it still seems like I should be further than I am. So I can, you know, I, I, I try not to get too down on myself because there's there's nothing else I can do at this point, but rely on the subconscious processes that absorb language learning and rely on them and make sure that I'm exposing myself to content that will keep me on this path until I reach, you know, what I'm going for. So was it around your fifth year that you started immersion learning? Yeah, so it was it was at the four and a half year mark after it was a long and cold and sad ride home from drive home from uh, the JLPT into the second time when I realized, oh, yeah, this I have not gotten better. And this last year kind of feels like a waste. And And it was that was the first year that it felt like, OK, well, I really haven't made any progress because I have nothing to show for this because I just studied a bunch of grammar and Ankit a bunch of vocab and that wasn't enough. So it was at that point I also started uh, getting external feedback. So when I didn't have my rivals in, in my study group and all I had was one tutor who I was paying, I wasn't getting the candid feedback that I needed on whether my study methods were being effective or not. And so I started, again, like I said, I don't consider myself to be too stupid, but I, it was pretty clear that I was missing some, some feedback at that point. And I was starting to be like, oh, gosh, do I just have some sort of learning disability here? Like, I, I don't understand why this stuff isn't sticking. So I, I stumbled upon the book Make It Stick, which is a book about, I think it's like cognitive psychology around how, how, you, how we learn things and what the most effective ways to do that are. So one of the things that they mentioned in there is that, well, if you're taking a test and it turns out that it doesn't work, then your study method is probably flawed. So at that point, it was like, okay, there's something wrong with my study method. I need to find something else, and I don't know what that is yet. So I need to figure that out. And so it was at that point on that cold ride home that I, I had that, that realization. And it was from that point that I said, okay, like, let's lo look into this. It still seems like Anki is something that's really useful because it helps offset the forgetting curve. And that was something that came up in that book as well. Just that you're going to be forgetting things. You need to figure out how to offset forgetting things. Anki is a reasonable software solution to that problem. So I started diving into that and figuring out, okay, well, how can I optimize Anki? And then I stumbled upon Matt vs. Japan's videos. I think I had seen some of those videos before, um, like pop up in places, like uh, learn Japanese subreddits and that sort of places. But I I wanted to ignore him because he was not Japanese. And what could I what could I learn from another guy, Gene? Uh, nothing. Uh, and it turns out that was wrong. Uh, I learned quite a bit from uh, Matt vs. Japan's channel, and it was it was at that point that it clicked that. Oh yeah, someone had told me about AJAT in the study group, but I thought that they were a fluke and that they got really good at Japanese because they had 
um, superpowers, super Ethiopian powers, and I did not have those those powers, so uh, it wouldn't be reproducible. Um, also, I, I think it may be at some point I confused AJAT with AIAIJ, which is an integrated approach to intermediate Japanese. So maybe because both of them start with A at some point, I had thought, oh yeah, I'm already doing AJAT. Like that's that's fine. Oh wait, that's that's a different thing entirely. That's a really bad textbook, um, not a learning methodology. So I had I had ignored AJAT because it wasn't really on my radar, and uh, it was from that point that I started diving into the AJAT blog and that sort of thing, and started figuring out, okay, well, how how do I you know set up an immersion environment and that sort of thing and uh, so i've been at that actually for about a year and a half or wait wait wait, wait. uh it, it'll be two years in january so i'm still a, a little bit under two years as far as actual immersion based learning uh, i thought when you, you talked about the age i thought you're gonna say you spent time learning how to navigate the website first <laughs> uh, luckily matt had a video guide on that by the time i was ready to explore it <laughs> Oh, perfect. That was pretty clush. I mean, you've yeah. Talked... That's why I didn't get to it the first time. Probably, honestly, I do remember the homepage. <laughs> but I mean, you talked a lot about like books, for example, and content in the language. And I mean, that's something you've prided yourself a lot on reading over two hundred books now in Japanese. So I mean, how much of it would you attribute to, I guess, immersion-based learning? And I guess on top of that, how would you say it's kind of helps you in your journey with Japanese. Yeah, yeah, the, the 200 books thing is like, uh, I, I don't have a lot to point to for six years. And I feel like in the last year and a half, getting through that has been uh, something that it's like, okay, well, this is what I set out to do. So right here it is. I've, I've finally started using what what I had been building up potential for in this process for so long. The immersion based part of it is the doing part of it, right? So right. I I had read a couple books before the immersion based learning, but I didn't I didn't understand that it was okay to not understand everything, right? I wasn't I wasn't okay with tolerating ambiguity uh, while I was reading through the story. It needed to be you know perfect. I, when I was starting out, I might you know have an English translation on the side just in case I did get stuck. Wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any little bit of nuance and that that's that's one of the things that in immersion based learning you you learn really quickly is a hindrance so you stop you stop uh getting stuck on every little word it's okay to not understand a sentence a a word a page uh you know it you just start to grow this tolerance for ambiguity and then suddenly you start to understand more and more of it and then suddenly you've got, you know, 200 books read and it's like, oh, I actually did understand the plot for some complicated things. So that's that's kind of cool. So, yeah, immersion based learning played a huge role in that. I would also say reading was the most important part of, uh, at least for me, the immersion based learning process. You know, I you know watch anime and J dramas and everything else I can get my hands on. But I I, I came here to learn some. To, to, to learn Japanese so that I could, um, you know, read read games with heavy text. And also, I was super into manga in high school. And it, it's been nice to get back into that. I would say, actually, I'm probably more into manga than games at this point. i give a little condolences out here to Tales of Series A. They will be missed in Kanji Eater's heart. <laughs> no, 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 no. So it, it, uh, Tales of Series just had their 25th anniversary yesterday. I posted my collection to Twitter. If you want to see how big of a weeb I am, uh, you can see it there. I, I don't have any Tales of Body Pillows, but I got I got some pretty close to that in the deep weeb spectrum of things. You know, I got a couple figurines and stuff. Yeah, Kanji Eater is not deep enough yet, but go check not out the enough. post. Soon. It's, uh, I'll, I'll get there. I'll get he'll, there. He'll, get, he'll get there. He'll get there. I'll get there. I mean, speaking of getting there, going pretty deep into all the kanji you got out here, um, higher ups at work started to take notice, am I right? And kind of, right. And it kind of got you a little opportunity out here to actually travel over to, I guess, the motherland of uh, games, manga, anime, you, say, you name it. So that I guess... Yep. <laughs> that's that's what that's what i kept calling it too the motherland man the motherland oh man 
So I guess you were a, you were given the opportunity to work there in I guess the same company you were working in in the U.S. Just I guess the Japanese branch. So I guess kind of having that opportunity come out. Did you ever kind of like a little bit before this? Did you ever realize you wanted to live in Japan for a period of time? Yeah. So it was. Let's see. Okay. So a co- yeah, a couple things happened. Happened to happen, and they were very convenient for me. So I was right around when I decided to do immersion. Uh, it was it was before the I, I found immersion based learning. It's like I need to spend some time in Japan because apparently that's the way that I'm going to get better at Japanese. So you know I, I'm married at this point, and, and I so talking with my wife, she's also into this sort of thing. Like we went to our honeymoon in Japan. Um, we took. We've taken like five trips over to Japan in five years. So you could say, uh, you know, it, it's a deep weeb family. But the, the what, what were, it, it wasn't too hard to convince her that, hey, it might be a good idea to live in Japan at some point. So with that kind of set, it was like, all right, this would be something good for us. This sounds like something fun. At some point, we would like to spend at least three months in Japan because that's what a tourist visa from the U S is going to get you. And it'd be like, "Eh, but probably no more than a year. So when the higher ups at work, yes, my, the CTO of uh, the, the company that I work at was like, Hey, Kanji eater, you want to go and, uh, you know, work in Japan for six months. It's like, Oh wow. That is exactly what I was asking for. Not six months ago. It was also kind of funny because I had actually asked the previous CTO, for this exact thing, like a transfer opportunity uh, between our company and it's it's actually a separately owned company, oh, but okay. there's a there's a shared parent company there, uh, and so sometimes we'll do like knowledge transfers and that sort of things between the two companies, and it's mutually beneficial. Uh, but anyways, it came up that uh, you know I I had asked the previous CTO, he said no, and probably didn't didn't push it any past that. The new CTO comes in and is just on his own, says, I already talked to the president of the company, and he says, you are good to go on this if you want this. And I'm like, okay, well, as long as you let my wife come with me, like, I, I'm cool. I'm just not going to do this alone. Uh, that, that would not be a good thing for uh, a marriage is uh, six months apart, I, I didn't think. So I, I, I made sure that that was a, the one condition, and they respected that. And uh, yeah, so managed to get over to the motherland motherland the deep weep motherland and i guess um i guess it wasn't that difficult of a decision to make when it's just they just hand it to you they're like hey your wife can come it's time to go yeah and it was that simple of a conversation i will say it took about a year for all the paperwork to actually go through so it it was like hey uh cto says this looks good let's 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 ask the other company if they're down for this and so they said hmm well why don't you send him over here and make sure that he likes working in japan and so i was like okay cool so i i kind of was like dang they're gonna know that i suck at japanese they're not gonna want me to be over there um and honestly like is okay so so they said have, have him come over here so the next event that they had was actually in Tokyo and there was like a two week thing where uh, a lot of people higher up were doing some executive style meetings and I got to sit in some of those. And then the latter half of the two weeks that I was over there, they put me on their data science team and I essentially worked with them on that. They did put me next to like one of the two other white guys in the company. So I think that was like their backup plan just in case like if this guy is really awful at Japanese, like at least this other guy knows English too. Uh-huh. And so I was I was kind of worried about that. You know, it's like, okay, am I just going to be over here and then it's going to just be all English all the time? And uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, I at, at that point when I had to fall back to using like the guy that I worked with, um, he's he's quite capable. And he was speaking to me in Japanese. And at one point, he did quiz me if I understood something. 
And I said like the opposite of whatever he was asking. And he's like, all right, we need to switch to English. I was like, God dang it. <laughs> that only happened once though. So, so it was like, even at that point, it was like, I was probably four and a half years into, I had been doing traditional language learning methods. They weren't useless because I was able to do like basic conversation and get through uh, essentially that work for two weeks to a point that they, they did invite me back and they were like, yeah, we would love to work with him some more. Uh, I will also say that my introduction, uh, maybe I'll, I'll put this into perspective, into perspective, my introduction to um, this Japanese team, uh, they gave me a standing ovation afterwards oh, wow. because, uh, yeah, Nihongo Jozu, right? So <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't expect it, right? And you know I had that down pat. So it was like, I, you know, <laughs> when you have enough time to prepare, like you can impress that people with these little things. It is those day-to-day -day interactions that it will be what people, you know, base their perspective off of you in the long run, though. I uh, definitely found that out. And so, so anyways, but they did like me. Um, I managed to hit it off really well with the, um, the leader of the data science team because we talked a lot about like manga, like a, a lot of things that people probably haven't heard of. He gave me some suggestions that I'm still a little too spooked to read, like <laughs> Golden Gold. Uh, check that one out. Uh, Imuri, he also told me about Made in Abyss before I it was on my radar. So um, very cool guys, very cool team. Um, and, and so, yeah, I managed to hit it off using, and, and that was just it. They were like, oh, he can keep up with conversations with us about manga. So that, that was like a foot in the door. And fr from there, they invited me back for six months. And that's that six months was, um, yeah, a little bit different because when I showed up, I expected to, you know, I okay, I, I haven't shared this story anywhere before. So this is a Korikara exclusive. Ooh. But there's normally a key card to get into, you know, big buildings, right? Right. This building, there's like a long line of Japanese people walking into it at the right time. I did not have a key card. I also didn't have any way to communicate with the company like the first day that I was there. So I just walked in and I just I just walked in past the what I should have been scanning a key card into and I just walked right in back to my old seat. And so mm -hmm. I'm sitting in a seat that six months ago was my seat <laughs> and now is no longer my seat. In fact, nobody else is over there. The whole entire team that I had been used to being over there was not over there from that two weeks. And so one guy, one guy says, he sees me over there and he says, oh, you're here. Why are you over there? Like, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to get started. <laughs> and uh, he was like, oh, yeah, you're not even on that team. And so the team that I thought I was going to be on for this six month stay turned out not to be the same team. So they actually put me not on the data science team this time. They put me on essentially what I'd been working on over in the States, which was an architectural team. So how do you connect multiple systems? What are the overall patterns of software engineering that people are using uh, across systems? So it, was, it, it became, at that point, it was like, okay, well, I didn't even expect to be on, I, I didn't expect to be on this team, but not only am I on a different team, but this is actually kind of a step up. Like this is, this is the team that is like working across a lot of different teams. And this is really similar to what I do in the States. So I was like, oh, I'm way more comfortable with this. The team that I'm working with is like all Japanese all the time. Like I, I don't have to worry about, um, you know, getting <laughs> getting chastised in English or anything if I answer something wrong. Um, so it was it was a really cool, dare I say, upgrade uh, of teams. At least it was a, it was a better skill set fit for me. So uh, yeah, that was a really really cool surprise on my first day after I had snuck into the company. Wow, well, I mean... Accidentally. I, I didn't accidentally. intend to sneak in. <laughs> you had to cue the Mission Impossible music here yeah. with the Japanese subs. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's pretty... I mean, I'm glad we got to hear the Korakara exclusive story, guys. Remember, never heard anywhere else world premiere. Exclusive. Anyway, exclusive. <laughs> But, I mean, it's really good to hear that you had kind of the all Japanese all the time experience rather than getting like, Jozu everywhere you go and hit, hit with the classic, 
all right, I'm going to talk to you in English after you spoke like two minutes straight to me in Japanese. The... Oh, that's that still happened, you know? That like, still it, happened, yeah. It, yeah, like I got plenty of Nihongo Jozus. Uh, I, but it, it happened a lot. So, so I was over there for two weeks, right? And right. people at least came somewhat familiar with my face. And then six months later, uh, came back for a six month stay. It's like, you know, the the novelty of me knowing, you know, how to introduce myself in Japanese wore off very quickly. And, you know, people people did just start to communicate with me in whatever language they felt most comfortable, which was almost right. always Japanese. Mm-hmm. And there were still points like I had I had someone that I worked with very closely that very much was trying to learn English and he would always try to speak uh, in English to me even after we were speaking in Japanese and I yeah I would always just respond back to him in Japanese he would get a little frustrated by that I could tell like I I don't think of Japanese people being very passive aggressive or getting upset easily but I could I could tell sometimes it it would fluster her, him a bit, and I think that's also to be expected. It's like I'm not that good at Japanese. Um, I he, he you know he obviously wanted something different, and uh, <laughs> I I didn't I didn't try to you know be difficult with him, uh, but it, I was also over there for my own reasons. And the president of my company actually specifically told me. Yeah, make sure you're just using Japanese over there. I want you to get good at this. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'll just fall back on that if if nothing else. So it was it was nice to know that I had um, uh, Papa CEO's blessing. Remember, you always got to make it into an anime first. You got the rivals. Now you got the mission that you gotta uh, you gotta take. <laughs> Best way to learn Japanese, guys. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, talking about introductions, you happen to introduce yourself to 700 people twice over there. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty incredible feat, I would have to say. And I mean, pretty nerve wracking, too. How did that even happen? How did you end up in a situation where you had to t- 700 people at the same time yeah. twice? Sure. Like public speaking, regardless of the language for me, is is nerve wracking. It's not something that comes naturally. Um, you know, I I'm I'm not an eloquent speaker in English, and I'm undoubtedly significantly worse in in Japanese. So, you know, I tackle it just like I I would in English. I practice and you know memorize a few phrases a few key points along the way and make sure that i stitch it together into something cohesive right so right. at least as far as the 700 like okay so that was they have these monthly meetings where they introduce new people to the company that's that's not too unheard of even in american companies uh, i will say it is nerve-wracking knowing that you are the worst person at a language and then knowing that you are going to be addressing them in that language and that you won't know when you mess up, but 700 people will. So I did have, I did have you know, a little bit of um, nerves going into that, but I, I just practiced it and managed to do all right on that one. And I, I will say I did many introductions to many different teams. I did presentations to different teams. And some of them went really well. I would say I would say 99% of them went really well. A couple times, though, like I didn't practice enough and it really showed. So maybe those are the more interesting things to talk about. So anyways, with with um, with presenting to like 700 people, it was like my 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 manager came back to me and was like, oh, man, you're you're Japanese in these in these situations is perfection i i just can't believe how good your japanese is and then it later on i i think i did like a, a farewell like from during the two weeks day right. and oh man i it was just awful i i i forgot what i was saying halfway through um i don't know maybe it was some cold medicine i was on or something i'm not sure but it was just like huh i need to wrap this up and i just I, I don't even remember what I said. I said, entered it quite Sayonara. curtly. 
Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> something like that. And uh, I, I, I ran as fast as I could out of the building. Essentially, no, it was. I, I, I had I had a little bit more tact than that, but not much. It was it was pretty darn rough. I will say the the most nerve wracking presentation that I had to give. So I I gave a handful like I gave an hour long one in Japanese about what what my company had been working on, and that was like the first week I was there. And then I gave the the most nerve wracking one though was uh, we had been working on a presentation like the week of, and. The, the morning of, they they told me, hey, this presentation that we've been working on, you're going to present it to the department, the entire IT department. And I guess it wasn't the entire ID, IT department. It was the really important people from the IT department. So they they were like, all right, you're going to do this in like after lunch. And I was like, okay, well, I uh, I kept telling, oh, muzukashi. Uh, this is, <laughs> is going to be rough, guys. Are you sure you want me to do this? I, I like I was really trying to tell them as, as much as I could like no don't do this to me like this is bad but eventually uh the stages of grief wore off and I, I I settled on acceptance and I was like all right this is a good opportunity I'll just do it and honestly that that one went really well I I got another standing ovation which is when I started to realize okay like I'm still a novelty like this is like I'm a couple months in like I don't see anybody else getting you know like this sort of fancy treatment so so it was like, yeah, I, I'm still a little bit of a outsider, but dang, these standing ovations sure do feel good, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love Kanji Eater out here on the stage. <laughs> Keep, keeping it real. Keeping it real with everybody. Keeping it real. Hey, we'll give you a standing ovation after this one too, don't I, worry. I look forward to it, yeah. Yeah, I, I wish we could get more people on here, to be honest, to give you one. But, hey, everyone in the comment section is going to be giving you a, a bunch of clap emojis. I'll tell Please you that. Please clap, yes. We'll, we'll add it in post. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Please, there we go. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of software engineering positions in Japan, uh, I saw, require no Japanese knowledge at all. Do you think mm-hmm. your position would have been possible if you didn't know any Japanese? Yeah, that's that. That is an interesting question because I I also thought about that a little bit. I'm not really familiar with what other Japanese posi- positions would be like, especially if you don't know Japanese in Japan. Um, so I can say from from what I was doing. So first off, I I did get a bit of a feeling, like I said, that I had I had an advantage coming from an internal company. Right? It was like we're sister companies. They're going to make it work because they want it to reflect well on them. Just like I want to make it work. So I I want it to reflect well on our side of the company. Right. I was kind of like a mediator between them. So I think no matter what, even if I didn't know any Japanese, they would have found a way to make it work. I don't think that I would have gotten, first off, the opportunity at all to be over there if I didn't know any Japanese. And I don't think that I would, I know I would not have had the experiences with the people that I did had I not known Japanese. Um, So kind of unraveling that a bit, the CTO that gave me the opportunity knew that I was into Japanese because I talked about it a lot. I talked about, oh, I just started reading some manga and this was like before my immersion stuff. I was like, I just read a thousand pages of manga. I'm so proud of this. And that was that was in our first conversation, like me and the new CTO. It's just like, yeah, dude, if, if you want to know something about me, manga and metal. There you go. So it's like I made an impression and that really stuck with him. And that was, you know, the seed for him that, you know, push pushed me into Japan. Being over there, like I said, they put me next to somebody who was speaking English as, you know, they're it, I'm assuming I'm assuming that it was just in case in, ca- in case and and you know what you, you got to kind of appreciate that too they don't know how i'm coming in they're they're willing to give it a chance and they do want to make sure that it's a success so they put somebody capable next to me right uh so so i appreciate like that that sort of thought and then you look at kind of how it evolved that okay well they actually moved me to a different team that has a little bit broader impact and now it's it's not really like that i'm I'm working with people in Japanese that if I did not know Japanese, I would not have been able to work with them as effectively. Uh, I am convinced of that. So it it did pay off all of my time studying and 
talking about it and getting up to that point, I would say. Did your Japanese improve a lot by the end of that? Like, did you get a six months to worth the, the jail? <laughs> it, it, it improved six months worth. So right before I went to to Japan, I took the JLPT into practice test and I could not pass it before. And right before, after six months of immersion based learning, I managed to get past that plateau where I couldn't pass it before and now I can. So then six months in Japan, it wasn't like I some sort of light switch hit and all of a sudden I got really good at Japanese or something like that. It felt a lot like what I had spent the last six months doing in immersion-based learning. And so at this point, I'm probably about five-ish years, five and a half years into Japanese. So I, I don't really... I, I didn't I didn't see some immediate boom like hey like I, I'm suddenly really good at Japanese or something like that it's like okay well I spent another six months I got even better than I was before but that's still not going to be enough to even pass the JLPT and one which is still kind of weird to think that despite me being able to work with people proficient uh, you know being able to do pr- presentations reading comprehension uh, especially in, in that small of a time space like on a JLPT test because I hadn't been spending time reading things that are really dense like novels or something like that in short periods of time that's still something that I wasn't able to do that's not to say like I I'm I was you know super good at listening or even the grammar sections on that or something like that like all of the skills are still at a low enough level that they all need to be brought up but they all have continued to rise over over the time that I've been putting in the effort and i mean six months worth of getting better is always great and i mean i guess going towards another aspect of japan as well as always i guess the relationships and you spoke a little bit about this that you were able to meet a lot of people and if you kind of weren't given that opportunity you wouldn't have really been able to meet some of those people in japan so i guess how did you end up meeting people because i know for a lot of people who have gone to japan Becoming friends is pretty difficult with a lot of how it is over there, and especially in Tokyo when everyone's kind of really business focused. You kind of have to find places where you, I guess, have like similar interests and kind of find that. So did you end up finding a lot of people? Were they more mostly at work? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So first off, I, I, the the original business trip that I had to Japan, uh, right. which was two weeks, that that started in Tokyo, but their main office was actually in Osaka. So okay. most of my time was actually, well, actually, it's not even Osaka. It's as I mentioned before, uh, a, a little bit. Uh, well, uh, it, it's in the Kansai region, right? So yep. in that in that area, um, so that that's where I was living at that that during that stay. Uh, those the people that I met. Uh, one of the best ways was there was a uh, a club uh, outside of work that it um it was like from with people from work they had a hiking club so they invited me to that like really early on and I was like oh I'm not super into hiking or exercise or anything like that in general but I think this would be really cool to do um, just to surround myself with you know, more Japanese people so. I was like, all right, I, I'm open to it. So I went and did that, and it was an absolute blast. So had a lot of fun with them. We cooked out, and I ate a bunch of weird food that was ended up being pretty good for the most part. Uh, I think that we had, like, these mountain potatoes. I don't recommend those. Uh, but everything else was pretty good, lots of yakiniku and that sort of stuff. Um, but anyways, so so doing that had had kind of that first thing uh, that was with all coworkers. I. I didn't make friends outside of work. It was always with coworkers, and then we would go and do stuff if I felt like it. Right. Um, the coolest thing that I did with uh, some some people from work was uh, one of the people that I worked with was a, a woman who grew up in Kansai, and she was very, very Kansai. And what I mean by that is she was very outgoing, super... Um, just super friendly. She's awesome. I still talk with her and uh, one of the few people that I regularly try try to keep in contact with um, because, yeah, she, she was awesome. So she also was super into, is super into like games and manga and that sort of stuff. So 
it was very easy to have conversations with her about the things that I was interested in. And so the coolest thing that we got to do was there was actually an escape room in Japan and it was uh, themed in the promised Neverland. So that's, you know, pretty popular series. Uh, the, the new anime is coming out uh, for the second season uh, here in, in January. So like check that one out. It's very cool. And I got to say escape rooms in Japanese in, in Japan was the coolest experience of my five trips that I've had to Japan because it was it was like being in a video game it was like you, you go into this room and like people are acting they're all dressed up and it i've done escape rooms in america and it was just like hey get out of the room or else it's gonna <laughs> blow up and then it, here it was like okay well you're in an orphanage and you need to escape the orphanage essentially and uh trying to figure out the little puzzles that they had put in the rooms and then they had this character like a live actor so it was like being a part of a performance as the mother character and that lady was crazy i thought she was going to kill my wife who was also there didn't speak any japanese and uh she would get asked questions in japanese and uh then get yelled at you know when she wasn't able to respond which i found quite entertaining i think <laughs> my wife i mean we're still married so i think she was all right with it but uh it was it was a lot of fun I've never heard of. I didn't know that they had escape like anime rooms in team. Japan. Check them out. Uh, maybe maybe post COVID. I mean maybe pre COVID if if you really want a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's gonna be a real fun time. Oh man. I mean post COVID, I'll check it out for sure. Don't get me. Your... <laughs> yeah, guys. Probably not pre COVID. Yeah, and... <laughs> uh, you have to have some sort of time machine, I guess. <laughs> I yeah. I was, I was like thinking like, oh, that's this. Uh, I don't know how you're gonna do that, but hey during covid has if you get the opportunity to go to an escape room pre-covid like i do please do so (laughs) yeah you had me thinking first i was like man that's you really need to find that time machine (laughs) that's what i'm here for make you guys think yep oh yeah i mean you guys got to check out the episode we did with kanji eater on the deep weed pod there's a lot of thinking involved over there without a a doubt the goofiest episode that we have made to date (laughs) I'm, I'm glad i mean i blame you guys I, I completely blame you guys hey it, in, the it, it is, in, the, in the best ways in the best ways the best ways that was a lot of fun it was, it's, we, we talked about it we really enjoyed that a lot of fun i mean it's always fun talking to you kanji eater and well, i mean you. likewise <laughs> appreciate it appreciate it and I, I guess kind of capping this off over here kind of we talked about how you've kind of went through your entire japanese journey with the language starting out with the whole idea of i, I want to play more tales tales of series games and kind of going through you had your time going in a language class in college and you kind of after graduating you got more into it by yourself kind of side hustling it out and then actually getting the opportunity to go to japan go and work with people in while well, you're doing your job in software engineering and you're using the, the actual Japanese kind of coming a long way and you're going into escape rooms promised Neverland style I mean probably the highlight of it all am I right <laughs> yeah, that's something that I completely that's agree a, that's right there guys remember you gotta escape rooms. but I mean kind of encapsulating all of this up would you return to live in japan again i know you talked about wanting to maybe live there for like maybe like a year max going with your wife but after kind of going through this experience having japanese and japan is such a big part of your life would you ever think about going back yeah so actually by the when i got back the cto of my company asked me are you ready to go back (laughs) i just (laughs) got back like no no I so it, living in Japan has always been a temporary thing in my mind because uh, I got it. I got it pretty good in America. I'm going to have to post a picture of my desk setup, but it's too big to fit in a Japanese apartment. OK, so it's like I there are certain luxuries that I'm just used to uh, being over here. Also, being closer to family, it's that's naturally a, an important part for some people like my wife, not me. Though. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> so so it's like. Could, could I could I go back and you know spend some more time over there? Of course, uh, but I would say like after I got back after six months, I was definitely ready to have some time over here again. I've things like the food like got old uh, eventually. 
like uh, my my wife cooked for us daily and she cooked a lot of japanese things that she was learning and they were really good but you know you can only eat mackerel so many different ways until it just starts to taste like a really salty disgusting fish so i uh we we got really tired of the food and you know since we've been back uh me and my wife in private have just been bashing on all japanese food and how much we hate it uh but at some point it turned back again and now we're like oh yeah japanese food is really good we should go back sometime so <laughs> you know it's it's one of those things i think i will continue to have a uh, you know relationship with japan where you know sometimes on sometimes off but uh probably america will be the home base and i will exercise the uh the u.s visa as as much as i can i would i do think it would be cool to work over there for a full year and then get citizenship uh and then you can you know if i ever needed to escape america because the feds come after me with some of this deep weeb stuff i've been posting like i know that i could you know hide out in japan or something yeah they're gonna be looking at what's this deep web podcast i don't like that yeah (laughs) yeah i think they're already on to me man yeah Google yeah. rewrites your search results if you search kanji eater to kanji water. You think that's a you, you think that just happens? No, nah, this is a bigger government plan, man. This is a conspiracy over here, guys. Yeah. Uh, don't remove the video government. Just just <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're listening. I, I know we got one of your most wanted guys on the podcast, but you gotta respect it. You gotta yeah. respect it. <laughs> but I think this is a, a good time to wrap up the podcast this time around. Thank you so much, Kanji Eater. Guys, make sure to go to twitch.tv slash Kanji Eater for all the Deep Weeb podcast goodness. You can watch live. You can check them out on YouTube and Twitter at Kanji Eater. Is there anywhere else you want to be checked out, Kanji Eater? No, just hit me up. I, so I, I did the same thing when I talked to 700 people for that second time introducing myself. Uh, if you have any manga recommendations, send them to me. So on Twitter, that's that's the best place to interact with me. Uh, always looking for some more uh, weird stuff to dive into. Yeah, I mean, basically doing the introduction to 700 people a third time here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, once again, thank you for coming on. And you know we have the tradition of the message to the Korekara listeners. So, Kanji Eater, I'm very excited for this one, actually. Really, oh boy. really want to hear it. it up. <laughs> Iping it up. Well, I'll just say, you know, same thing Eric did. Just no Chinese first, and Japanese will be a lot easier for you. Uh, wise, and, words. <laughs> wise, wise words. <laughs> and then I guess on, on a more serious note, um, you know, I talked a, a lot through this about start, starting out like my time management skills like I, I put other things on hold and I think I think that's okay to do uh, at a certain point at a certain point you also have to realize that you just suck at time management so maybe start with that uh, maybe maybe whatever you're doing uh, you know, there, there's always room for personal self self-improvement and if you're not spending any time on that well you're not going to get any better at some of these things that you care about um, peripherally so that is one of the things that i hope to have more conversations with uh with gentlemen such as yourselves on on my podcast is just you know what are some of the meta things that uh people have been learning about because for me like the big things that i've encountered so far is just this this balance of depth versus breadth right where it's like okay i want to get really good at something like japanese uh, but then i also need to not be a completely terrible person husband i need to not be a completely you know terrible worker uh th- there are all these different things so figuring out time management like morning schedules figuring out you know okay well like would i be more efficient if i spent more time meditating because that might help with concentration i've been doing things like exercising because i've you know read enough studies and see, uh read enough books that all of a sudden now in my late 20s i'm ready to actually start exercising when i always thought that was a waste of time before being a scrawny little weeb so 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 little things like that um i i think diving into that and spending some time on personal development while you're balancing out whatever you're super interested in that you can you can get way better results because that is what i have found in this immersion based learning piece it's not just that i've been doing immersion based learning that has helped me break my own personal plateaus it's that i've been balancing out other things along with it to kind of 
lubricate that pathway. So now it's a little bit more like a slip and slide, whereas it might have been like a rocky, craggy mountain before. Very wise words. Thank you so much, Kanji Eater. I can't wait until the next part of the crossover. Stay tuned, guys. <laughs> yes. Can't wait, yes. man. Can't wait. All right, guys. We'll catch you later. Peace. 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 Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. Looking at the calendar, this is going to be the last podcast of this calendar year. So on behalf of Eric and myself, I just want to thank all of you for sticking with us on our Kodakara journey so far. It's been a blast and we appreciate all of the support and we wouldn't have gotten to this point without you guys. We really want to go and thank everyone who has subscribed, liked, commented, listened to us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and any other platform it had a big impact on us and all of your feedback keeps us motivated and excited to keep putting out new content every day we want to also give a quick shout out to our guests you guys have been an absolute treat to talk to and we've learned so much from each episode and finally our patrons sad boy izenga 71 miku jack boy no eyebrow four and kh90 you guys have gone above and beyond for the Kodakata podcast and words can't begin to express how much you mean to us. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much. And just in general, we're truly thankful to each and every one of you for sticking with us and listening. 2021 is going to be an exciting year for the Kodakata podcast and we're going to have some amazing guests on. We can't wait. And guys, if you haven't subscribed yet, on YouTube. We're aiming to hit a thousand subscribers and it really mean a lot to us if you hit the subscribe button. So until then, happy early new year from the Kodakata podcast. Keep up the immersion. We'll catch you on the next one.